So, uh, it uh, should be a really fun talk here. So, we have two alumni from not just uh, ESRM, but actually this class are here. So, uh, Juliana and Chase took these. Uh, Chase took this class, what, like three years ago? Like the first one. Four years ago? First, what? Two we years ago was my last one. So, okay, so so he took several classes, <laughs> and you you were last year, right? Yeah, last yeah. year. Yeah, so a recent graduate, slightly longer graduate. So these guys, um, uh, again, we've had folks that uh, have gone to San Francisco, and folks that go to San Diego, and some folks that have stayed local. These guys are actually staying local, and it's neat that there's more and more opportunities here in Ventura County proper. Um, to do this stuff that you know five years ago folks had to go farther away to to engage with the industry and get employed and stuff but these guys are both full-time employees wow. very nice so I'll let them, <laughs> so let them tell the, tell them tell you guys about their job and their gig and everything but uh, without further ado this is Julian and Chase So yeah, we have, like you said, we're both uh, alumni, uh, we're both ESRM, we both took drone classes, kind of got into it at school, kind of at the beginning of the whole drone uh, experience here, where it started, and now we're employed in the drone industry. So we're kind of just going over uh, like the school, like what, how our school time was, what we would have done differently, what we suggest, kind of trying to help you out here. So my name is Chase Tillman. Um, basically, I began volunteering and helping Dr. Anderson Quite a while ago, I was going to Moorpark College. Um, basically, just met him on a visit and started volunteering, just doing random research, nothing to do with drones, nothing like that. I was basically just doing uh, insect invertebrate, invertebrate trapping, stuff like that. Just random. I would do anything I could, basically. Uh, so I did the insect trapping. I did another uh, fecal indicator bacteria study. I went down to the beaches, collected water every morning. Got paid for that one. Then I did Project Excesso, which I hope is still going on, but it's basically a uh, summer gig where we do beach work, we go out and try to get some rapid beach uh, information. It's pretty interesting. And then I took the first drone class ever here. Um, well, not for credit. <laughs> I took two classes <laughs> for no credit because I wasn't going here yet. And then I took the third one for credit finally. But uh, basically, the first class I took here was when I got into drones and kind of got my hands on my own quadcopter, which is the top right one here, the blade. Uh, it's, it's all right. <laughs> I mean, if you're flying into the DJI one tier, it's, it's a whole nother world. Um, but it's good to learn to fly like that. So I, that's kind of my uh, my genesis of getting into drones. Um, so yeah, so after that, I started using the uh, DJI Inspire 1, which is our main mapping drone here, at least it used to be. Uh, mapping whatever beaches I could. Yeah, it's right there. <laughs> this was broken. Did you break this, Chase? This uh, is, this is yeah, this yeah, I'll talk to you later. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was just mapping beaches, uh, kind of like a longitudinal study, um, not really going anywhere, but learning and just getting as much data as I could. That was pretty awesome. That's where I got most of my flight time. That's basically, I learned everything doing that, kind of going out, just doing it, just getting out there. And they need pilots, they need, still need pilots, so it's a great opportunity. Um, so I transferred over here in 2016, fall, and I just kept helping out. That's basically what happened. I continued with the AARR club, um, doing different mapping, doing whatever I could. And I'll get into my capstone later, which was involved with drones, but that's basically it. I just helped out, and now I'm here for now. <laughs> All right, so I'm Juliana. Um, uh, when I was younger, I was a real big computer geek, so I played a lot of computer games. I played StarCraft, Diablo, they were, so I was really good at hand going on the computer. Uh, I was really good at like, troubleshooting, things like that. Um, when I started college, I was at Community College at Ventura. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, so I kind of like jumped around through majors. Uh, I really liked the natural world, so when I transferred here, I decided to go into ESRM with the minors in biology and chemistry. Um, so, and then I took the drones class last year, so a year before this, and that's where I bought my first drone, which is the DJI Mavic Air. Um, and then I just graduated, literally just in December. So, <laughs> but I started working for Ail Acme while I was still in school. So through this drones class, I did a drone presentation where I modeled Scary Dairy here with my drone there. And when I did the presentation, 
our boss, Chuck, he was there, he watched me, he approached me afterwards, and that's how I got this job. So take it seriously, because you never know who's watching. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a, those are the models that I made of Scary Mary there. And that's pretty much like my background. I didn't really do, I was part of AAR for a little bit, um, but that was basically it. It was really computers and GIS. And even though that model's not um, exactly what we do, it's very indicative of kind of the modeling and mapping that we do at our job. So even though it's some random barn that she mapped out there for a project, it actually showed a lot to our boss. Because mm -hmm. what we map has a lot of fine wires and it's basically substation, electrical substation. So looking at that, he's like, oh, she knows what she's doing. So I take everything seriously when we do oh yeah. projects and stuff Specifically like that. in this class too. Because you're learning a lot of cutting edge stuff. Like we'll get into that a little bit later too about what you're actually learning. All right, uh, just a quick thing on my capstone. I don't want to get too into it. Basically, I did a comparative analysis between a LiDAR sensor using a, that hexacopter over there. I built that, kind of put it together with a grant, uh, threw a LiDAR on there, uh, never really got a map. <laughs> the map shown right there, <laughs> that's what I wanted. <laughs> so that has nothing to do with me and that. Oh, how is it? No. <laughs> it looks great, though. No. Yeah. So. Uh, Basically, I spent a while kind of troubleshooting that. I learned a lot, though. I mean, it never fully worked out how I wanted that aspect, but I learned a bunch, and it actually gave me a lot of credibility when it comes to figuring out sensors and kind of working with drones. Um, so actually, I compared that with the Inspire maps, just like I would do regularly. And then in the uh, bottom right picture, I did like a normal transect, kind of like a survey line. So we kind of took a profile <coughs> of the beach and a couple areas, and we averaged it out. So I did like volumetric analysis and uh, area analysis, that type of thing, kind of trying to uh, tell the accuracy and also the person hours and different different aspects of each sensor and how they would uh, compare to each other. And his LIDAR work actually uh, was, was beneficial for his, his hiring, the payload specialist, which we'll go into that a little bit later too. A little bit about my capstone, Chase actually helped me with my capstone because I didn't have my part 107 at the time, so he actually flew the Inspire for me where we flew uh, three buildings, the Sierra Hall, El Dorado, and then the Broom Library. And I did solar analysis maps of, uh, for solar panels. These are updated, I, I see my poster over there, so these maps are a little bit different than the ones <laughs> that have on the uh, This is the one I actually submitted for the geospatial review. So that's what that's what I did. Which is getting published also? Yeah. <laughs> and this or it's, it's being, it was accepted, yeah. Awesome. Excited. All right, so what we loved about ESRM and what we wish we, we did we focus more on. Uh, G for me, GIS was very important. It's for what I do at work, I use it a lot, especially coordinate systems. Like, take it seriously, the coordinate systems, you're gonna need that, especially for when you're making maps. I, you'll talk about that later, but I make the models. Like, I collect the data, I organize the data, and then I organize it and make it into a model, which we'll show you a little bit later. So you have to know what coordinate system you're in, what flight patterns you have, like, it's very important. So I would, I would take it seriously. What I wish we focused more on though was I wish we learned a little bit more Python programming language. I'm having to learn that right now on my own. I kind of wish we went over that a little bit more in GIS, but it's a little bit difficult still. And it's coming, it's coming. It's coming, yeah. It, it's really important too, especially for organizing data and stuff like that. Uh, Python is like one of the most popular languages for uh, data organization. And then I took the ESR, or the ESRM 370 this class and Getting my part on the seven was like one of the best choices that made and made, and this class is what pushed me to do it. Are you guys still doing the replace the midterm thing? Yeah, part one seven. Yeah, do it. <laughs> I mean, it's it, it's a hundred it's a hundred fifty bucks, but it's worth it. It's what got us the, our position, and we t we go into that a little bit more later too. It's very important, uh, long <laughs> hours and everything like that. Um, what I wish I focused more on in the drones was like more the mechanical me mechanisms of the drone. Uh, we didn't really go over that very much, and I didn't really like to think about it. Cause it's, but I was really into data, and that was my project was the data, so that actually helped me out a lot. Also in Capstone, the elevator talks, the confidence building, and how to sell yourself is very important. Uh, everything that you're doing in Capstone and in this class and all the volunteer work, it's usable. Use it. It's it gives you the credibility, it gives you the experience, and talk about it, say, oh, I did this, I did that, I worked with this. Like, it really makes yourself stand out versus, like, some other student or whatever. So I would be, I would take that seriously, actually, because I've used the elevator talk, 
I've sold myself in other, uh, even to Chuck, and when they came here to fly a thing, I went up to them and I used my elevator to talk. I told them what I was doing with my capstone project. I told them what I was doing in the Jones class, and it really helped me out. So. And I didn't tell him to say any of that. No, he did it. He did it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's important. Uh, yeah, so uh, also research, obviously. Um, I did a lot of it, but this school has more opportunities I've seen than many other places. Most of you just go to big lectures and do your homework and take your midterms, finals, and you're done. Here you leave with experience, and that, at least in this industry, that's probably like more essential than anything else. Because right now we're looking for pilots. Uh, number one, you do 107, so that's important, but that's just a test. Uh, experience is the other thing that we need, and that's so difficult to find in this industry. If you know how to fly, you know how to build and you know how to do all that stuff, you can find a job, like, I almost guarantee it. People are looking, they're not finding, there are not a lot of people that go out there and actually know how to fly and do this stuff. So getting out there, and or any kind of experience, doing for any job, this school offers it. Um, so many professors are looking for people to help you out, or for you to help them out. Um, also the trips were amazing. Um, I went to New Orleans with uh, Dr. Anderson, Juliana went to Costa Rica, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Those were great. <laughs> I flew there. Um, yeah, I mapped the forest. That was awesome. More experience outside of California, which mm -hmm. is pretty cool. Um, everything about that was amazing. So ESRM really helps you out, or school in general. And also Santa Rosa Island was just pretty awesome. Obviously, if you've been there, you know. Um, just a great place to go and unique opportunity that this school allows it. Okay, so a little bit about what we do. Um, we work at Aerial Alchemy. It's a mission-based remote data capture and delivery place. So basically, we're like a drone service company. We'll go out there, we'll fly the drone, we'll uh, scan. Mainly, our main focus is like substations right now. So we'll scan it, which means that we take like, a shit ton of pictures. <laughs> yeah, and then we go and we bring them in. And uh, so that's what I do. I'm the data supervisor. I organize all the data. I generate the models. We use a Bentley Context Capture. Um, right now we're trying to explore different software, so we're going to get into Pixar D, Correlator 3D. There's a lot of different software out there, um, but currently right now we use Context uh, Capture. So you have to organize, we do a lot of ground work and a lot of aerial work, so you have to put the ground and the aerial together, and it takes a lot of like, this point is here, it's, that goes back into the coordinate system, you have to make sure that the, uh, the coordinates are right and they line up, because once the model's generated, you want it to look complete, and we'll go into some of the models that we've done, actually. Uh, and also demo models for companies, so I've gone to uh, LA Department of Water Power, and I've shown them the models that we've made, um, PG&E, so <coughs> when, when we generate the model, we have to go and present the model and show like what you can use it for. Uh, you get accurate measurements from these models, they can overlay it on old blueprints, so they can see like, oh, say I need to bring in a new transformer, I need to figure out a path to get, because when you're in those substations, it's kind of like, it's kind of, there's a lot of stuff everywhere. It's a lot of electricity, it's really hot. So you have to organize the way you're gonna get this really big transformer in, and with the model, it gives you like an outline of where it could go, how big the space is, if it's gonna fit there, if there's gonna be a line above. So it really helps in the engineering purposes, and that's what, that's what I do. Well, I'm the uh, payload specialist, so I basically my title is for focusing on the payload, which mostly be a camera in our case. Our highest resolution camera is Sony A7R3. It's like 42 megapixels. Um, but other than that, I do most of the testing, basically all the testing back in the shop. Um, I'll fly the drones, I'll get them ready, I'll tune them, I'll take them out. I'll also do a lot of R&D, which is very interesting. Um, in this industry, you can't really just Google something and figure out, oh, this will work with that. You have to actually go out there and try it or think. <laughs> That needs your brain, unfortunately. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that, that's pretty interesting. I basically, back at the shop, but anything needs testing, I'll take it out and kind of play with that. Um, so improving, optimizing, piloting, I'll, I'm trying to make everything better. We're, we're so on the like, cutting edge that nothing is optimized, basically. I'm, everything could be improved, um, from the drone, from the flight, to the payload, to the, basically anything you can think of, the GPS, um, Everything I'm trying to think, how can I make this better? How can I make it uh, more accurate, more consistent? Um, so that's that's a lot of my work, my time. And yeah, basically, I basically just do everything at shop. Out in the field, Juliana and I, or just me, if she stays back, we'll do the ground photos. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another team that actually pilots the drone and manages the camera, the payload. So we'll kind of walk around and take photos of the substations on the ground, and then, like she said, manage them with the aerial. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of 
a lot of different stuff, and it's always changing. I'm never, never set in stone on my job. Or mm -hmm. such a small outfit that it could be anything that I do end up doing tomorrow or Monday, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How many yep. total people do you guys have? Ten. Yeah. Ten. Uh, <coughs> the time might be five. So. He also writes out all the uh, checklists and everything about, he makes like, okay, if you're going to do the drone, he makes like the missions for them, so it's always a good map. Oh, there's a couple pictures of uh, that I put in there. So those are two of the drones that we have that uh, Chase helped build. Um, they're holding their arc payloads there. So this is one that originally we were going to leave, was it? last week or something. Yeah, we were trying to get our teams together. So we have two teams. Chase and I are on a team and then this is a that's one that's our maintenance chief. He's building one of the booms right now. There he's on another team and those are like our materials for the team. A little bit under is like a toolbox and stuff. So every team has that. They also have generators, they also have batteries, they have chargers, everything like that. This is an overhead shot I took of uh, our little shop. So this is this is how it looks like our everyday life. Um, and this is what you're looking at when you're organizing the data. <laughs> yeah, looks like a mess, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So all the circles <laughs> in the top, yeah, <laughs> looks the circles in the top are where the drone is flying and taking the pictures, and then down here, on the bottom, are like all the ground photos. So you have to make sure that you have to put those together. Those are all automatic tie points that it generates. On the left there are, are blocks. You're making tons of blocks, hundreds and hundreds of blocks of organizing everything together and merging and area triangulating. And it's definitely, so you change my desk for like eight to nine hours a day. Yeah. When, Live the drain. When, yeah, let the drain, yeah. When we do have data, when the, and it takes a while to get this, and then you render it out, and it takes like a week for it to render out a model. I'll show you like, we'll, we'll get into it later, I'll show you some of the models that we've done. Uh, so I just want to show you our drones. So we fly a Y6 setup, <coughs> which is a little different than anything in here. Closest thing is the hexacopter over there, which I use for my capstone. Uh, so those, each motor is on its own arm. We fly coaxial motors, so there's two motors and two props on each arm. There's only three arms. Uh, it's a little different than most places. Um, DJI doesn't really, I don't think they have anything like that, and they're the, most, the biggest drone company out there. Basically, the reasoning for us to do this is for uh, basically reliability. So on a hexacopter, um, if one motor uh, fails, then the opposite motor basically has to spin down to counter it, otherwise it'll flip over. On the Y6, you just need one motor to spin up to basically double it up. So they're, they're a little safer, they're a little little trickier to tune and get going, but for the most part they're very interesting. Once I learn how to fly them, how to tune them, they're a lot better in my opinion. I like how they fly. And then you can see our payloads. Pretty big cameras. Um, I mean they weigh like three pounds or so. The lens is way bigger than you'd normally want on a flying unit, but uh, it's that high resolution that really gets us the contrast and kind of gets us out there and separates us from the, the main market. Do you have a question? Yeah, are the two props, say, on one arm, you have the top and bottom, are they spinning at the same uh, RPM, or can you change that? Uh, they're slightly different, um, just because of like the air, um, air flow between them. I think the bottom one is slightly under there, it's like a negligible difference, but they're oh. real, real different. They're counter-rotating also, so, yeah. Do you guys choose not to use DJI pilots and build it yourself? Uh, so... <laughs> Our boss actually does not like DJI at all. Well, yeah. so there's some conflict, yeah. um, at least in the military. <laughs> <laughs> in the military, there was some debate over China getting our data. Basically, mm -hmm. all the photos to DJI would go through their app and they'd have access to it. So it, it's not very secure. Having your own uh, drone is more secure. You control everything. Um, so it, it's largely security. It also mm -hmm. separates us, because I bet you 90% of the drone companies out there are using DJI. They fly great. They have good cameras. Everything about them is easy. You move the stick up, it flies. It doesn't crash. <laughs> it doesn't allow you to crash if you want it to. But these, it's a higher risk, higher reward, basically. And it separates us. It allows us to get that resolution that other companies can't really yeah. And since we work a lot with like the military, um, they actually ban DJI drones, so we can't even fly DJI drones. We have, we're going to model one of the ships for them because uh, we're trying to research on how do you model a carrier while it's moving in the water, so they can it's better for doing maintenance if there's a model of it instead of sending a guy running around or climbing around the ship or whatever to look for defects. We're going to 
for their modeling, so you can't use the UBI drone for that. So they, they build all the drones. I've started building one and called it my drone. So. Work on the avocado. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an avocado ranch. It's pretty cool. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> You guys didn't breathe any avocados today, though. Oh, man. <laughs> they're like $10 a piece. I know. They're organic. organic. They're organic avocados. Yeah. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> so expectation versus reality. So this picture right here is like really how it is. I was, I was like, oh, this is perfect <laughs> for how the drone industry is. Because you're always like, oh, yeah, this is the end goal. But how do you get there? There's so many obstacles in the way. And uh, so we're not flying drones every day. We don't fly drones every day. Uh, there's a lot of research and development, like uh, Jason mentioned earlier. Um, there's a lot of trial and error. There's no set rules or guidelines. We're making them yourself. So, like I said, like if you go on Google and are like, how do you do this? You're like, you get like one thing. <laughs> oh no, like, I gotta figure out myself? What? <laughs> yeah, so you have to have the confidence to know that what you're doing is gonna work and then be okay if it fails, because sometimes it does fail. And then you have, just have to know the steps you need to take in order to, to change that, in order to like, okay, this failed, what do I do next? You know, it's, we're, we're scientists. You gotta figure it, you fail, and you figure out what you're gonna do afterwards, and you gotta be okay with it. And there's a lot of that um, in this industry. Um, yeah, so the industry is so new that really no one knows what they want. <laughs> the customer doesn't really know, uh, you don't know what you want. It, it's a little, um, little odd going out there and, because you have to figure out what they want without them knowing what they want. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it, it's not super yeah. easy. So it, it's definitely a, a balancing act, kind of trying to get jobs and hold jobs and kind of securing them and kind of getting out there and giving them data that is useful to them. So you have to know what they do and how they do it to figure out how to get them something that actually improves what they do. Um, just giving them a bunch of photos or a map doesn't do anything to anyone. Really. No one wants that anymore. Um, we're past that. It's so easy to fly a phantom out, get some quick maps, but people want now is analysis and kind of figuring out how is this going to help me? How is this going to, like she's talking about substation, kind of path through. So we're trying to figure out different uh, systems that they can open up the maps and kind of click through them and kind of give them a lot more metadata, which is not even really made yet. So to figure some things out, we have to start from the ground, basically. Um, and it, it's just so dynamic, like I was talking about my job. I don't know what I'm gonna be doing Monday. Well, I kind of do, but you never know. <laughs> <laughs> like, it changes all the time. Um, we're getting a new drone in, we're getting a new camera in, getting a new job. I mean, we're not set with new substations, but now we're gonna be doing power this week on like, ship work, stuff like that. It doesn't, we don't know exactly what we're doing, so we have to prepare for everything and get ready to change on the fly. That sounds like us. <laughs> 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 Uh, so some of our suggestions, um, like I said earlier, take every presentation seriously because you never know who's watching you. Um, yeah, I didn't expect that, so you know, just do your best because you never know. Uh, get out of your comfort zone and network. I actually have a story about the drone surveys. Um, so I went to institution to try to get some drone surveys, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, and then I sat next to what, that photo earlier, the, our maintenance chief. This is before I worked for Aerial Alchemy, before I knew anything about Aerial Alchemy. And I was like, and I started talking to him to some stranger. I was like, hey, I'm in this drones class. Can you take this survey for me? And he's like, oh, I work with drones all the time. Like, da 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 da. And then we met and we became friends. And then I started working for Aerial Alchemy. And look who's working for Aerial Alchemy. <laughs> the guy that I sat next to at institution asked about the drone survey. So, you know, you never know who, who's around. And, you know, like I said earlier, sell yourself. And you know, be confident. I mean, if you get something wrong, it's okay. You know, nobody's gonna judge you on it. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's such a small community that if you do meet someone else that's in the industry, it's likely gonna bring you more opportunities, more job offers, uh, someone to help you out. Even. But uh, so volunteering, like I mentioned, it, it gets you out there, no matter who you're working for, what you're doing. It just helps build a resume. It helps like network. Um, I probably wouldn't have had this job if I didn't have a closer relationship with Dr. Anderson because I wasn't even in the drone class when I met my now boss. Um, Juliana in her class was doing the presentation and Sean sent out an email saying, hey, there's a guy coming from local business. I was checking out the presentation. You might want to come by and meet him. So I said, sure. So I met him and that's how I got my job. So it wasn't directly related to work, but it was kind of connections that were made that kind of indirectly brought me there. That's a drone maker. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, if you fly drones now, basically, um, so the 107 is 
entirely important if you want a career here. Everyone, it's just so simple to get, basically cash and uh, test that it's required for everything. So if you do want a job, just get the 107. The last two years, it's not that long, I already had to re up it, but uh, <laughs> it helped out. Um, also, I like logs, which is something we just figured out yeah. we should probably have been keeping. Yeah. That helps a lot. Um, even if they're just simple, like I flew on this day at this place for this long with this drone. That's all you need. It doesn't have to be exact. It doesn't have to, you don't have to have data behind it. Just a simple flight log. Because um, our, our tower jobs are actually looking for people that have 30 hours utility flight hours and then 50 hours of general commercial flight hours, mm -hmm. which is a lot. And I, I know I have the hours, but I have to go back yeah. and I have to go through all my drone deploy little maps and figure out how long each one was. It's kind of a pain and that doesn't even add up to everything because I use other applications, I get other kind of flights. So it, it's just a general good idea to keep some kind of flight log. Yeah. And anything that you're doing, like even here, if you're mapping, if you're like flying a drone and you're mapping, write it down. Yeah, because that's considered a commercial a commercial use. So write down your app because we're scrambling, like trying to figure out like what day did we fly the drone in, in drone stats? Oh man, what did I do? How long did we fly up for? Like we're having to like make a full list, like a spreadsheet. So I would just start now, be easy. Gives you more credibility when you go and try to sell yourself. You know, I have this many hours on this drone. I mapped this, or I took scans of this, or I took stills or videos, whatever it is, just write it down. It's easy. And that's the end of our presentation. Um, we have a quick video. Oh yeah. Kind of an advertisement for a yeah, no company. Problem. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm also going to show you a few of the models that we've done. So our boss actually came from the uh, cinema industry, kind of doing photography and video and stuff with that. Um, so he's very good at editing. Them, so he's so like see, yeah. He did all of it. So this is uh, mainly all the stuff you're going to see here. This is our first substation that we scanned and moss landing, so it's like near uh, like Monterey Bay area. You'll see some of that. And then that's the, that's the live tech. Yeah. sensing technologies to solve data collection problems critical to measuring, safeguarding, and improving the fundamental elements, food, power, water, environment, required to meet basic human needs. Our accurate 3D reality models are the foundation for the creation of the digital twin. Understanding the role of the 3D reality model is an important first step and is the cornerstone for the transformation to digital engineering. So we are streamlining we and simplifying every step of the workflow, from mission planning to autonomous flight to data processing to review of the analytics. Working with Bentley Systems, a global leader in comprehensive software tools for the design and management of infrastructure projects, we are overcoming resistance to adopting new technology, while at the same time enabling companies to collaborate in ways that can provide a step change in productivity as well as design and maintenance. Our services are unique. We design and manufacture our own UAVs, which means we can ensure seamless integration with the other key components of the digital engineering workflow. This enables us to provide civil engineers a more direct linkage between analytical technologies and real-world infrastructure problems. Large-scale accurate reality models enables cost-effective ways to evaluate new concepts faster and with greater frequency than with traditional prototyping and testing methods. This is not just about the UAV, it's about changing the way businesses understand and interact with the physical world.
Take the names and go out to the conference. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is that substation that you see in the video. So the, I actually did these individually by themselves as one, two, three, and there's a fourth one there, but that's like an old one. So this is a huge substation. This is a 500 kV, this is 230 kV, and there's a 115. And in this one, uh, we actually incorporated uh, aerial photo uh, photogrammetry, ground photogrammetry, and LIDAR. So we put all of them in there. Just to see like just how huge these stations are. With the LIDAR, you pick up all these little feeder lines here, up the top there, because with photogrammetry, you can't really see those. And it gets pretty in-depth. It's, like it's got a cache here. But it's all energized for the most part while they're flying it. 500,000 volts. <laughs> yeah. You can feel electronics that you're holding just buzzing, mm -hmm. gets warm. It's hot under there. Yeah. It's a weird. So do you have to shield the units differently or you just fly a regular? Uh, we just fly a regular <laughs> for the most part. We just have to stay at a certain standoff distance mm -hmm. and follow all of them. And wear electrically hazard, mm -hmm. electrical hazard clothing. We all look the same when we're in our clothes. Yeah, this is not even the most detailed one. This is like the first one that we've made. So, and then you can go in here and you can uh, do a measurement and everything like that. So you can measure how far away that is. Anyway, these are huge. They don't look that big in the model, but they're they're huge. And what's the spatial accuracy you guys have on these? So it's 1.7 1.7 to 2 centimeters. Uh, it's not. It's, it's like that's how accurate uh -huh. it is. No, so this is the only one we actually use LIDAR. This next one... What's accuracy? Is that due to LIDAR? No, no, it's due to the, like the coordinate systems and how you're lining it together and putting it on the plane. But this one here, we have one we just did, it's just like a little sub-piece of it, just to show you the, how detailed it is. So you can see the oil seeping out of these areas. And so that's why the models are good, because you can see, like, okay, it's rusting here, oil is coming out of here, definitely not good. So you can actually see the detail in all of this. And this is us like walking around, like Chase and I walk around these massive things and, and take pictures of it from the ground and then the aerial makes up the top. And then we put these little markers down here to give us like a something that we can see from the air. Is it like a GCP kind of thing? Or? Yeah, but they're not, we're not, we don't survey them. Okay. So one, so it's it's just something like instead of like, oh, I'm going to look for this, this rock over here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just something that we can see in the aerial photos and the ground photos. And then it gives you like a direct point. So it's like that, it's that exact pixel, which improves your accuracy too. So. And a lot of these companies right now have like, for one substation, just thousands of papers of blueprints. Like mm -hmm. It's all analog, basically. So going from that to this is just a world of improvement. And so there, so when you deliver this to your customer, um, do you do you give them training on it, or are they just like you know what I'm saying? Are you giving them the data, or are they looking at the data on your servers? Like how does that? How do they utilize the info information? So right now, at least, uh, how we're doing it is we put everything on a hard drive and then we give it to them. Like it gives them the model, the project, like everything, like that that picture that I showed you of that project. We give them that, and they're already using the same software. We don't train them necessarily. We kind of like advertise. You can do this with this information, or you can do that. Um, but they go through their own training through the we've software. Also, yeah, we've been collaborating with a company called mm -hmm. or Bentley that makes context capture. So they kind of work with us as well. So yeah. they train them on how to use it and what you can do with it, and we just present them with the data. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they use other software like MicroStation is a big software they use in engineering. Um, it's like builds for engineers for uh, making maps and stuff like that. And you can lay these models on top of that. And it'd be like an exact. Oh, this one looks like this. So, yeah, that's it. Any questions? Questions? Comments? Nice presentation. <laughs>
but then her part took a lot longer. <laughs> yeah, uh, that model, that you, that first one, Moss Landing, is over 9,000 photos. So you have to put them all together, you have to line them all up together. I mean, it's very situational, honestly, So because it doesn't always work. Like, sometimes <laughs> it's like, eh, it's on its side, and you're like, oh no, it's a coordinate system thing, and you have to try and figure out what coordinate system it is, or what is it doing, and then you have to kind of flatten it out. And so it's a lot, like I said, a lot of trial and error. So that project, that Moss Landing project, it took like probably like a month to get everything lined up together. And then to render it all, it takes like a week. So a week of it just like processing. That's if it doesn't cut out and yeah, <laughs> start at 99%. The power doesn't go out or something. Yeah. yeah so that. And then this one right here, I actually just finished it. Yes, I looked at it this morning. The render just finished. So, And then that's the thing too, you can render out you're like, okay, I think it looks good because like that picture that I showed you with all the tie points, you kind of look and you can kind of flatten it out and see if it's level, but you don't really know until it's actually rendered. So like this model, this is just like a little piece of it, but the full model, there was a part that was lifted. So it was like this after it was all rendered, after five days of being rendered. And I'm like, oh no, now I have to go out and figure out why it's like that. And then I have to fix it. And then you have to render it all again. So it literally just finished this morning, like that model. And it probably took about two weeks to get that's like Monday through Friday, two weeks of it, trying to lighten it out, and then another five days of rendering it, and then seeing that there's a problem, and then trying to fix it, and then rendering it out all over again. So yeah, it's very situational. It depends on how many photos you have. And once you start getting the hang of it, like that Moss Landing one, I was still learning. And so I was like, okay. So it took a little bit extra long, because I was still trying to figure out how to do it. But this one took a little bit shorter. Uh, what hardware are you using to render? Like what, what computers are you have? So we have like a whole like server set up. Uh, so we have like a Threadripper with two, so two GPUs in them, um, each one. So we have. I think they're just 1080 Ti. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so two, two of them in each. So we have three nodes and then a Threadripper, and it all runs onto like a server. And then like I have like my own little workstation, but everything is thrown onto that server base. So you guys don't use the cloud. You guys do it all locally. Yeah, we do it all locally. So two 1080s takes you five days to. Most is a lot of the GPU bench, right? Well, so we have different yeah. nodes, like yeah. three nodes, and they all kind of work on different parts of it at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what CPU they are, but I think it's equally or well, it might be Threadripper, it's Threadripper. That's just, we only have one Threadripper, yeah. yeah. We only have one Threadripper with two CPUs in it, and then we have three nodes with two CPUs and then 64 gigs of memory. And then we separate it into tiles because the so, project's so big, and each node takes a tile. So we run four tiles at the same time. And there's it's like hundreds of tiles. It's huge. Yeah. So it takes it still takes a while. And it's very, very dense, very heavy like uh, tie points and stuff like that, point clouds to generate something like this. But we have another guy that's kind of in charge of the server. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He knows a lot more about the details a, of yeah. He built it and everything like that, so he I just do that stuff and make sure that it, <laughs> it works again. <laughs> 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 the yeah. There are more than just us. Mm -hmm. So she does all the, uh, this part. Um, when we get back to the shop, it's basically all Juliana. Mm -hmm. But out in the field, there's usually four of us. So like we'll, we'll be on a team, and then there'll be <coughs> two others piloting and observing. Mm -hmm. And there might be other observers also. So but, um, for the price point. Uh, I don't, we don't really know the price yeah. point. Yeah, they don't really tell us that kind of stuff. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think for the Moss Landing one, it like, it was anywhere, it was like 20 to 30,000 for, for that project. Um, but, uh, so I can't do anything without the data though. So when we're going out there and we're getting the data, it has to be precise and if the data's not good, then it, that's what makes it hard. So we're always coming up with new ways to get the data. I have a question about your monthly. So it was 9,000 photos of ground and aerial. Mm -hmm. And then how much like square miles You know, like how much area you covered? I can't remember. I don't. It was huge. It was, my boss always says it too. It's like 20 acres or something. It's, 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 I don't know. Something like that. It's huge. It's it's it takes forever to do the ground stuff because the ground one you're like, <laughs> yeah. like for every, everything. It's like, but the air you just go up there. Yeah, the air is super. <laughs> 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 we're like, oh, we got photos. And we're out there just like. 
They're all sitting down, like yeah. setting up a mission. Like, <laughs> we're, all, we're in the trenches. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got, well, I got a little shock one time, freaked me out. But, yeah. yeah. Static version. Yeah. It's still, it's still freaking. I mean, I had to take a break after that. Bunch of, uh, yeah. Yeah. Pictures, do you have a certain height you have to maintain, or you just take random pictures? And so well, not uh, random, but some sort of sequential. So we have a uh, monopod, which is a broomstick <laughs> that we modified. <laughs> we put a little uh, three and a half inch, wherever the uh, connect the camera on there. So and then we have a certain angle that we keep on a little uh, gimbal up top. So we maintain the certain height and a certain angle and the standoff distance, preferably. So yeah. we're still like optimizing it. During the moss landing, we kind of were all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, after that, we kind of got a little better, mm -hmm. kind of able to tilt it up a little more, get a little more detail, yeah. a little higher. Because at first, you're worried about the horizon. You're worried that the sky will get in the photos and kind of it'll match the sky too much and it'll just get all throughout your model. So we're trying to aim at the ground, which only gives you a certain mm -hmm. limit of the actual, yeah. We actually tried a new method when we did this one here um, after learning from Moss Landing. So it, uh, when you work with the software, you kind of know like what it likes and what it doesn't like. So you can be like, okay, well, I want to do this this time. So we, if like you, you try out this, and if it doesn't work, then you're like, crap, it didn't work. <laughs> you know? And then that's what sucks, because then you have to figure out why it didn't work, and then you have to try to make it work. But um, and like, like you said, on this one, we kind of tilted up a little bit because it's like, it's huge. These things are huge. So if you're looking at the ground, you kind of cut it off. So you can kind of tilt it up just a little bit, making sure that you still have the right overlap. And then you can get more, like on this one, that's why it was so mo more detailed. This is what we call, we call it the air line. This part right here is when it stops. It's like, because you get the really high resolution because you're on the ground and you're close. And then this up here is called the air line, we call it. And that's when you know that that's when the aerial photo started to, to take into effect here. But even with this, it looks really good with the air. This is probably one of the best models that we've made so far. Yeah, up top, just like a little bit milky, you know. Because you have to be, you have to maintain a certain feet above the line, right? It's like 50 feet or whatever. It's like 20, 30. But when you fly above it, you're like. We go up yeah, higher. We go up higher. We don't want to be spoiled. Mm -hmm. yeah. One more question. So uh, you run an A7, Sony A7 here? A7 R2. Uh, what, what, what lens are you running? Um, on the ground, we use a 11 millimeter. It's mm -hmm. very wide, but mm -hmm. not wide enough to have fisheye. Nice. I mean, it, the software can correct for fisheye, but we don't want that. We want as accurate as possible, as many straight lines as possible. Uh, for the sky, we've been messing around a little. Right now, we're using 24 to 70 um, at 35 millimeters, but we also just got 24 to 140 or 240, actually. That one's a big guy. Uh, we've been using that more for towers. But uh, on these guys, about 35 millimeter on the A7. Yeah. The so challenge with the, sorry. It's the same camera on the drone? Yeah, so that you guys yeah we have the same, uh, two different cameras, but yeah. the same one, just different lenses. The challenge with the, when you're in the air and you, you have like a, a lens that can see closer is you have to make sure you get the appropriate overlap. Because if you're up there and then you miss it, it's like, oh no, we can't go back. Like, and then that makes my job harder. So yeah. you try to get it right the first time. Can't go back. You gotta get yeah. it right. You gotta get it right. <laughs> you yeah. don't, then good luck. Then, then my life is hell. <laughs> but, you know, but it works out. Yeah. Yeah. So. Is part of the milkiness because you guys have to maintain that distance from the, or is that just like, what comes from the yeah. outcome. Yeah, I'm always advocating, let's get low, let's get low. <laughs> I want it to look better, but you know, it's safety, safety but first, so. Yeah, and they have regulations out there. Yeah, yeah. Because we have to stay a certain distance from like the highest point. It's not mm -hmm. like just uh, like 50 oh. feet or whatever from this. It's mm -hmm. probably like 100 feet from that mm -hmm. we're close to. Um, also the sun, you know, can reflect off it. There might be some yeah. blown out areas. There's shadows and stuff here too, like if it's during the day. The shadows are kind of a pain. We got yeah. lucky in Moss Landing, it was like overcast the whole time. <laughs> so yeah. everything was nice and mm -hmm. smooth. Yeah. And the challenge with that, since the ground takes so long to do, you, it takes the whole day, so the shadows are shifting throughout yeah. the day. And mm -hmm. it's like, it'll, it'll change things. The program will freak out a little bit, and you gotta tell it, no. Yeah, it's a, it's a learning game. Cool. Yeah. So what was the size of your data set? Because I mean, there was 9,000 images, like how large of a, that moss landing one was four terabytes. And you're looking at terabytes of data yeah. that you guys collected. Yeah. Wow. That's what the model did too, after it generates the model and everything. Yeah. 
So like uh, delivering that is a challenge too. So <laughs> that's why the, our, the internet where are we at because we're kind of like in a branch or whatever is not the best. So that's why doing the cloud is not the, the best option for us. We deliver everything on hard drives. We're still just figuring out like the, the best way to deliver the data. That's also big data. It's like it's, it's a challenge. Cool. Awesome, you guys. Good job. Thanks for having us.